Welcome to the Your Audio Solutions Podcast, episode 16. Thank you very much for tuning in to this week's episode. Um, it's a great one. But before we get into the details, I want to say a big thank you to the listener and to the guests. We made some pretty cool lists on the Apple podcast format. Uh, so top 50 on music interviews in the US. Uh, actually top three um, in the Portugal, which is kind of cool. Uh, and that's thanks to you, the listener. So I really appreciate it. And I think with your help, we can make this a top 30 podcast in the next few weeks. So what I'd like you to do is whatever you feel comfortable with doing, share this podcast to your friends, whether that's email or Facebook Messenger or Facebook, Instagram, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Uh, and I believe we can take this to a top 30 music interview podcast. Uh, I would really appreciate it. And I still, and I obviously appreciate you guys listening so far. So thank you guys. On today's episode, we have a Jeremiah Graber. Uh, he's the co-founder and owner of Global Positioning Services, which is a management company who has a pretty impressive rooster, such as Vance Powell, Greg Fiddleman, Ryan Hewitt, Joe Cigarelli, and many others. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard about those guys. And uh, Jeremiah is their manager uh, and is the owner of the management company they're assigned to. Um, and in this episode, you can get some valuable insight as to how one of the best management companies out there operates and the work they do for engineers and producers. Uh, I think you will, you will love this interview. And uh, we spoke about how to negotiate rates, budgets, um, if or how to, as, a, as an engineer or producer, how you can get a manager, if, if you should get a manager and why you shouldn't confuse management with employment opportunities. Um, we also spoke about the impact from the kind of CD sales and how he finds works for his, for his clients and much more. Um, I think you're going to love it. But before we get into this conversation, I want to tell you about a free guide you can download right away. It's called Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base. So if you're a home studio owner, freelancer, or you just graduated from college and you want to get into the industry, uh, this guide is for you. In this guide, you can you can learn my tested email script and how to on how to contact bands online, which um, I'm doing an episode specifically on that coming up. Um, you can also learn how to get into studios if you want to do that, because I worked in several studios in London. I share my tips on how to get work in one, basically. Um, also, how to price yourself, which is super important. Uh, getting into value based method which i will also talk about in upcoming episodes i think you'll love this guide and i think you're going to see some improvement so download it using the link in the description below uh, but now over to jeremiah Graham. cool man so yeah welcome to the podcast man i really appreciate having you glad to be here so I thought it would be cool to start this conversation off because maybe not that many people are familiar with who you are and your work. So it would be awesome if you can tell us what you do in the music business and yeah, who you are. Well, uh, I'm a manager, uh, have been for a long time, although the early part of my career started out on the label side in the A&R department. So, yeah, I've been in the music industry for probably close to 25 years, and the current company, uh, Global Positioning Services, is my company that I co-founded with a friend and work colleague that I met back in the day at A&M Records before Universal Music Group bought Polygram, so going back quite a ways um, at this point. But, um, yeah, we are a... Uh, predominantly a producer, engineer, mixer, uh, management company. Mm. We do manage some recording artists. Um, so we do, we do have a sort of artist management um, piece uh, of the picture here. And um, our job is, as managers is to, you know, uh, on the producer mixer side is to, you know, effectively act as agents trying to find, procure, 
um, new work for our clients, trying to put them out there in the in the conversation about upcoming projects, and uh, generally trying to you know keep them working um, as often as as we can. We do all of their business, so we handle all of the deal negotiations, we handle all of the billing and accounts receivable, we coordinate all the projects, do all the scheduling, everything from hiring cartage to booking session musicians and studio time to, um, you know, ordering hard drives. So right. it's a, it's a pretty full, full on, uh, operation that we have here. And, um, the roster is nearly 30 clients deep at this point. So right. we're involved in dozens upon dozens and dozens of records every year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys have some awesome clients on your rooster. Uh, some of them I have interviewed, I think, as well. Uh, yeah, I know you have. Yeah. Uh, Vance, did you, have you talked to Joe Ciccarelli as well? No, uh, is Vance, uh, possibly Ryan in the future. Uh, okay. But yeah, and they're awesome, awesome people, obviously. Um, so, I mean, before you started GPS, um, or and or actually, could you tell us how you got started in the music music business initially uh sure yeah I, to um, be a manager or was no there no else? i i didn't actually and um i always um had a real interest in record making though and i knew that going the route of um becoming an audio pro myself was not really in the cards for me um How just come? sort of ac access to i grew up in the northeast in vermont and you know, there's a, you know, there there are some successful artists that have come out of Vermont, and there's some successful record companies that have come out of Vermont, and there's a couple of label, um, sorry, uh, recording studios around, but it, it's not, you know, it's not really a center for the music business in any way. And if I was going to pursue a career as a, you know, recording engineer, and then hopefully eventually as a record producer, I I, I would have had to relocate and you know, find a way to um, either uh, study or, um, you know, get employment um, under someone's, you know, supervision as a mentor or something like that. It just, it just never really um, felt like the right fit for me. And I'm, right. I'm not particularly inclined to be more on the technical side of record making. I'm much more interested in the creative side of record making, the sort of the you know, artists and repertoire. So mm -hmm. the A and R sort of path was one that I um, identified long ago, and so I moved to Los Angeles. Um, I decided that <laughs> growing up in the Northeast was, um, you know, I'd had I'd done my time and didn't really have an interest in moving to Manhattan to uh, try and find my way into the business. So I decided to pack it all up and move to LA, and that was 1994. Wow. Yeah. And through a, you know, sort of series of random meetings and, um, you know, connections made and that sort of thing. And uh, at that time, when I was much younger, the sort of, you know, the, the self-determination to try to find a way in, um, mm. I ended up securing an internship at A&M Records, um, which at that time was located in the Charlie Chaplin movie lot which is now Henson Studios and Henson um, Productions oh, I see. In, Ho in Hollywood. So um, I got a job in the A&R department as an intern, helping out everybody and anybody who needed it, um, everything from reviewing and proofing label copy to you know, running um, DAC <laughs> cassettes up and down the stairs to people and you know, all kinds of odd jobs. I mean, literally did the coffee making and emptied a few waste baskets and that sort of thing. And eventually, um, you know, by being around and by being, you know, I think a responsible uh, person, I, I started to sort of move through some of the, you know, open positions there and um, eventually was hired as an assistant, an executive assistant to two A&R um, guys who uh, shared an assistant. One was a vice president of A&R, one was more at a director level of A&R. And I was helping them, assisting them with all manner of projects, everything from, um, you, you know, helping to coordinate records that were, they were making or 
um, you know, helping them get, you know, book their travel to get across the country to see an act play live and that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, one of my bosses um, started to, um, you know, give me more to do. And I started coordinating um, sessions and coordinating, um, you know, booking stuff and coordinating remixes and, you know, all kinds of, you know, little, little jobs. Um, and eventually, um, that executive moved on and I was able to sort of move up a bit, um, and become, you know, a sort of made man as it were, an A&R, um, sort of, you know, junior, junior A&R guy, Mm -hmm. um, and was continuing to, you know, go out every night and, um, you know, see bands, see artists performing all over town. This was back in the day when, um, you know, there was a pretty, healthy live music scene in Los Angeles. So, you know, the Sunset Strip, et cetera, there were lots of uh, live music venues that were still rather viable. Right. And um, Is that not the case so, today yeah. anymore? Um, there are certainly plenty of uh, venues in L.A., but oh, many things have moved east. So, ah. you know, sort of Silver Lake, Echo Park, Highland Park, um, that part of LA, there isn't a whole lot anymore on the West side of Los Angeles. There used to be a few clubs you could rely on. Um, some of the more mainstay clubs in Hollywood, like the Troubadour obviously is always going to be a, um, sort of a a cornerstone venue, but other places have sort of come and gone and, you know, um, I think whatever the economics of uh, booking bands versus, say, a DJ (laughs) or uh, attracting people who are interested in bottle service and, you know, Instagram opportunities, (laughs) right? It's like a, it's a different, it's a different world here now. Um, But back then it was pretty active and you could, you know, you could see acts perform and this is, you know, generally pre, pre widespread internet and, the only way to discover something new was to stumble upon it live or, you know, perhaps be in a record store. Um, you know, even before Amoeba came to Los Angeles, there was a wonderful record store called Aaron's oh. in Hollywood that was an independent record store. And you could sort of pick through the racks and find CDs and find vinyl of bands that were releasing music independently and, you know, start to sort of figure out, um, you know, some of the up and coming acts that were coming through. And it was a really, you know, you really had to do the work yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> um, to discover music now, right. There's entire research departments and record companies and all kinds of, uh, algorithms yeah, exactly. and other things running all day long, trying to figure out, you know, who's blowing up on SoundCloud and that sort of thing. But, um, it was a different era back then, certainly. Yeah, of course, and, man. you know, the, the record making part of it, um, you know, we were making records at A and M with developing artists and, you know, the budgets mm. uh, back then were probably, you know, comfortably, you know, two to three times what they are now. Um, this more, more money was being spent on making records. More money was being spent on studio time and hiring record producers and engineers and mixers. And um, it seemed like a healthier... Um, healthier time and just in terms of the, the overall um, economy of, re- of the recorded music side of the business, yeah. things have certainly changed. Since yeah, then. exactly. Um, so, something I'm really curious about is, because you said you were out networking, seeing bands, you know, you eventually got an internship uh, and all those sort of things. So um, what did you find was the best way to network and grow your relationships within the industry? Did you find, did you have a strategy or what was your way of doing it? Yeah, really no strategy. I mean, just sort of trying to take every opportunity as it comes along, Um, you know, trying to stay kind of current with, you know, who, who people are and the positions they held in the business. And, you know, it's an interesting dynamic working inside a record company um, because there is definitely a hierarchy, right? right? So if you're a low man on the totem pole, a junior A&R person at a record company, you know, senior executives probably have less time for you right. than they do for their colleagues. Um, that being said, though, um, there was a, a guy named James Phelan who ran the A&R department for A&M in New York, hmm. who was definitely a senior executive and, and my senior and he and I became friends, friendly colleagues, 
um, in the business were definitely separated by many years in age. But despite that fact, he would, you know, come out to Los Angeles from time to time and we would maybe grab lunch or whatever. And it was actually he that, um, he and I started this company together, Mm. um, many, many years later. So, um, even, even though, you know, we were not sort of on the same level, executive level wise, um, many years later after other jobs that each of us held, we, um, got into business together and, and started GPS. So the, you know, the networking stuff, and that's something that I always remembered, you know, then, and I try to carry it forward now is you don't, you don't ever really know, (laughs) you know, who's who and who's going to end up at a, at a, at a particular company or uh, who you may in fact, you know, get into business with one day. So exactly. the uh, notion that, you know, giving everyone um, your time is, is a, it's a valuable thing because you just never know. And one of my, um, that, that same executive that I worked for at A&M who eventually moved on, he gave me some of the most imp- important advice ever, which was return every phone call. Mm-hmm. So even if, you know, if you were to call me and I didn't know you um, and I didn't quite understand why you were calling me or whatever, I'm still going to call you back <laughs> to, right. to figure it out. And maybe there's something for us to talk about. Maybe there isn't, but I'm going to call you back no matter what yeah. because I, you never know. You never know what someone um, – and at that time it was like, you know, you may have some amazing unsigned artist that, you know, could uh, could be just what we were looking for or something, right? So we mm. – we took it very seriously to give everyone our time and, and make sure that, you know, we return every phone call. Yeah, exactly. Um, have you ever found, because this is something I found myself is, which I used to do, is I always used to go out to networking events, you know, being a bit desperate for work and stuff uh, until you realize that actually never really works. It's better to build relationships long term and all the sort of things like put in the time. Is that something you have noticed too or... You know the networking event stuff. It's it's tough. I mean, I feel like um, for me, the that that sort of thing is every, everyone's in the same sort of situation. Everyone's sort of looking to network and make new connections and that sort of thing. And when you're in that type of I don't know sort of setup, mm. it, it doesn't it doesn't flow as easily or naturally as maybe you would like. Yeah. Um, I often find that simply reaching out to folks that you want to be connected with and asking them to take a meeting or have lunch or have coffee or whatever it is, is a, is a more direct way to go about it. Mm. Um, provided that, you know, you're not going to be wasting someone's time or there's a, there's a, there's sort of a purpose for, you know, you to be getting together. Um, yeah, exactly. you know, we do a lot of meetings here. Um, myself and the other people that work, um, at GPS, we, we take a lot of meetings, we go on a lot of meetings, we travel, um, across the country, we travel internationally, and when we do, we seek people out that we've never met before, or maybe we've only um, dealt with on email or over the phone. Mm. Um, so, you know, it does help <clears throat> when you're calling upon someone and you can say, "This is me, and this is my roster," because people take a look at the roster and they think, "Oh, yes, I'd like to meet this guy." You right. know, there, maybe there's something going on um, with his clients, or I've got a project that I want to talk about. You know, that sort of thing. So. Mm. Um, obviously when you're just sort of getting going in the business, it's a little harder to do, but you know, if someone were to reach out to me and say, I'm interested in sitting with you, if you have time, I'll, you know, can I come by for 15, 20 minutes? I'm, I'm going to consider that because, um, it's no, you know, sweat off my back really. And if someone comes through with uh, a real interest in what we're doing here or they're trying to network or develop relationships, I mean, I can appreciate that. Yeah. That's cool, man. So you were at A&M Records. How did you, why did you decide to start your own firm in the end? Well, so um, back in the late 90s, um, Universal Music Group bought Polygram, right? Mm. And back then, Polygram, uh, the Polygram group included A&M, Island, Motown, uh, and a handful of other um, record label sort of entities and, and um, other entertainment companies, publishing entities, et cetera. So uh, all of a sudden, A&M Records effectively ceased to exist. Right. And n- nearly everyone in the company um, lost their jobs. They were either laid off or simply terminated. 
um, there were a handful of folks that did make the move over to the new universal uh, configuration. Um, but effectively, you know, a few hundred people simply lost work. Wow, yeah. um, prior to that, um, I had an opportunity to take another A&R job at um, the Wyndham Hill Group, which is um, actually Wyndham Hill Records is a, a record company that um, was started in my home state of Vermont. Um, mm-hmm. And the label that I had grown up on, um, early pioneers of so-called new age music, um, but largely, you know, instrumental music, everything from Michael Hedges to George Winston and, right. and, uh, lots of really, really talented, um, progressive, uh, artists in between. Hmm. Um, but the executive that I worked with at A&M had actually gone over there and he called me up one day and asked if I would be, um, interested to come over and, uh, work with those guys, and um, I said yes. So I, I continued my my A and R journey uh, at that point, and I was working at the Wyndham Hill Group on all kinds of different records, most of it instrumental music, um, mm. which was a real sort of departure from what we were doing at A and M, which was obviously you know um, pop and rock and alternative and hard rock music, and you know uh, in pursuit of um, radio airplay and mm. <laughs> record sales. This was a whole different. Um, whole different vibe, um, but um, it was during that time uh, that my uh, future business partner James Phelan, who was at A and M, he also, um, uh, you know, effectively lost his lost his gig. Mm-hmm. And um, prior to coming to A and M, he had a producer management business, um, and he managed some of the greatest guys in the game, like Brendan O'Brien and. Mm-hmm. T-Bone Burnett and Daniel Lenoir and right. Jack Joseph Puig and Matt Wallace and Pierre Marchand and some some of the greatest, uh, most successful record producers of the of the of the time. Yeah. Um, he um, made a made a deal with a um, manager named Steve Moyer to uh, effectively sort of transfer his roster to uh, Steve and Jim. Uh, James came to A and M. And uh, after A and M ended, he got back into the producer management business, and eventually went to uh, took his business to Sanctuary, um, wow. which back then was a 360 model um, in a in a mm. real true sense. They had a well, producer management division, a uh, artist management division, very large artist management um, division, which the company originated um, by managing Iron Maiden. And then from there, you know, expanded considerably with offices in uh, New York and London and Los Angeles. And uh, they were buying up various properties um, at a catalog label, a frontline music label, a publishing company, a merchandising company. They owned recording studios. They bought Townhouse wow. in London and Townhouse Mobile. And Sanctuary went on a big sort of expansion. And, wow. um uh, after my time at Wyndham Hill, I actually went and worked with James at Sanctuary. We were managing producers, and um, I was there, I'd say, a little over a year, and then things started to get a little dicey at Sanctuary, <laughs> just in terms of uh, the way the things were uh, were being run operationally and, and other things, and it sort of you know became um, a bit unstable for us, and so we decided to leave. Uh, we left Sanctuary and we took all of our clients with us and um, a couple months later formally uh, created uh, GPS mm. and that was nearly 14 years ago. So yeah. it's That's been a cool. long sort of, you know, a long road and the sort of interesting intersections, um, you know, with various folks over time. Um, but yeah, so uh, James and right. I started GPS together and some of the clients that we had um, at Sanctuary, we still have, including Ethan Johns mm-hmm. and Noah Georgeson and a couple others. Um, and some of the clients that we um, first signed when we started at GPS, um, okay. our very first new client signing when we started the company was Billy Bush. Oh, and we continue to manage Billy you know, 14 years later. So, yeah. um, there's, you know, there's been clients who have come and gone in that period of time. Um you know, some people where, you know, mutually it feels like it's the right time to part ways and let people go try something else. Right. Um, I mean, the many clients we've had for years and years, and that's, um, 
you know, the way we like to do it. We don't, we don't um, want client turnover. Right. You know, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. if we if we can <laughs> avoid it, we want to be we want to be in business long term with folks. Yes. Yeah, exactly. um, and it's really you know in this particular area of the business, it's it's kind of necessary, right, to have a sort of a longer term mm -hmm. uh, strategy to things. Yeah. Exactly, man. Um, yeah. So, something I would love to ask you is because obviously you negotiate for your clients. You know, you said you find them work um, and all those stuff. So I'd love to know how if a if a artist or label contacts you saying they want to hire, let's say Vance or any of your engineers or producers, um, how, how do you negotiate their rates? Do you just say? Thank you for reaching out. This is the right take it or leave it, or is there more of a, you know, asking questions back and forth, finding out about the project? Uh, yeah, how, how do you how do you do that? Yeah, it really it depends on the project, right? So, you know, we work on everything from you know completely self funded artist projects all the way up to you know uh, major label projects with you know very healthy budgets yeah. and. Um, you know, all of the all of the decision making um, comes from our clients and how interested they are creatively to work on a particular project. Right. So there are definitely cases where you know we can't quite move forward with something because the budget doesn't exist, um, or there isn't enough uh, budget in place to really get the job done, and. You know, maybe we'll look for a different way to then approach it. Say, hey, we can't produce your record, but we can mix your record. So right. let's let's figure out what um, what budget will work to get this record mixed, and then you know maybe that's a way for us to remain involved. Um, there are definitely those cases where a client may just be absolutely in love with a, with a particular artist or a band, and they mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm not really too concerned with um, the budget part. I just have to make this record. Um, And then we figure out creative ways to, you know, sort of uh, maximize the budget that does exist, but also then, you know, make make a deal um, so that if, you know, things go well, <laughs> um, right. there's some upside um, sort of on the back end of things. Um, but, yeah, I mean, most, most people who are reaching out, um, you know, I think generally have done their homework or they're, you know, they're um, sort of established enough to know um, when you call on Vance or Billy Bush or Ethan or anybody yeah. that we might represent that, you know, it's going to require some budget to um, to get into a conversation like that. So uh, oftentimes we, we start with, you know, sort of reverse engineer the question. Instead of asking me what's it going to take, we just say, well, what do you have to work with? And, right. you know, if you have a budget, you're trying to get a record mixed and you've got 12 songs and you've got you know, $10,000, like, well, that's a little tight maybe for some of our guys, but let's figure out how we can get it done. And, um, you know, maybe we shave off a few songs and let, you know, the artist find someone else to mix those or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and the, you know, the, the deal making part of it is there's no, there's no formula. It's really just, um, an open dialogue with management or A and R or whoever we're talking to on the other end right. to figure out what is the what is the right balance between the budget available and how much of that budget can be compensation for the client, my client, and how much time can that get us? And you know, I think we're we're pretty good at striking the balance um, between all of those things. And many of our clients have their own studios at this point, so. Um, it does certainly make it um, doable uh, to say yes to certain projects, um, whereas in the past maybe a client didn't have a studio. We have to book outside studio time, and a third of the budget is now gone to booking booking studio time. So, right. um, you know, as the economy of things changes, um, so does our uh, flexibility and our willingness to try to get creative on deal making. Mm. Has there been any uh, instances where a client comes to you um, with a small budget, let's say? Has there been any instance where you have been able to negotiate so that they are willing to pay more? And if so, could you give an example of how you negotiated? Well, let me see if I understand your question. Is it... Um 
paying paying more at a later date or right yeah so yeah you, yeah paying more essentially to get a client to maybe reach your clients a fee and rate um if that makes sense yeah i mean certainly you know there's a there's always a point in a conversation where the um a hard decision has to be made mm. either we have to pass because the resources aren't there to do the job right Right. Uh, or the the person who's calling up um, figures out how to access more more funds to right. uh, to bring to bring to the table. Um, you know, we have been creative with deal making where we'll say, well, we can we can say yes to the budget you have now, but in the future, um, at some um, you know sort of milestone moment, whether it's you know, the band receives another advance or signs a deal and receives an advance or there's a publishing advance or they achieve uh, X amount of revenue on tour or they receive X amount of revenue through sync licensing, that there will be an additional payment to my client to sort of bring them up to a more full full fee, as it were. So, you know, we're open to all kinds of scenarios, provided that there's a realistic chance of those things happening, right? We don't yeah. do back end deals um, when we don't have confidence that there will be a back end. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. And um, I think it's a it's a it's a bit of a misnomer. So like, hey, you know, we'll we'll give you more on the back end. It's like, well, not if there isn't a back end. Um, <laughs> and you know, the way that um, you know things have been going for quite a while now, it's the the back end is the uh, you know, it's that elusive unicorn in the magical forest. It's like, <laughs> yeah. please, you know, <laughs> if if you find it, please tell me. Um, yeah. Because, um, you know, so much of what occurs now is guys are getting paid advances, and that's probably most of the money they'll see right. um, on a particular project. Although, with sound exchange and neighboring rights, um, we are able to um, access more, you know, income streams out there that um, aren't dependent on... Um, recouping advances and and right. uh and that sort of thing. So, you know, the the whole the whole name of the game is to try and strike that right balance. Mm-hmm. Um try to match up a client's enthusiasm to do the work, try and get the artist or the band and their team to come to the table with the right amount of resources to get the job done, finding the right balance in terms of time and um making sure that when we get into the studio that everybody's prepared and ready to work and this um, is going to go according to plan. When it doesn't go according to plan, that's certainly when things right. get a little dicey and costly. So Yeah. Uh, something I wanted to ask you before, actually, was, because I might be wrong on this, though, but I, I, I heard or read that there's never been as much money as it is now in the music industry. Uh, is that something you have seen? Have you seen a change in the last few years from how it was maybe 10 years ago has become better or more money in, in budgets or not? Um, I wish I could say that we've seen some of that money you're talking about. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, the, um, th- there's, there was certainly a, a pretty significant um, drop, probably, a, I want to say probably about 10 years ago when... Mm you know, the um, constant decline of uh, sale of physical product, the, you know, sort of continued erosion of the sale of digital product, you know, the iTunes Music Store, et cetera. Yeah. Um, vinyl hadn't really um, sort of made the comeback that it has enjoyed in the last several years. And labels, I think, were um, just being incredibly conservative and not spending as much anymore. And, you know, then budgets were just through the floor. And, you know, I'd be on a call and we'd find out what the budget is and they'd say, geez, you know, the amount of money you're talking about used to be my client's fee, let alone, um, you know, have enough to actually go make the record. So, you know, there there for everybody had to be a real serious belt tightening. Um, And that's when, you know, certain clients who didn't have studios decided to, um, figure out how to get that done so that any project that came along, you could really maximize the budget that was available and try and capture as much of that, 
you know, budget as possible. Um, and but it's come back. I will say that over over the years, as streaming has really um, expanded, and uh, you know, there's all the digital service providers from um, uh, Spotify to Apple Music to Tidal and everything else that's out there, and all the ways that people consume music now. It's really it's really a um, a sort of an expansion period, I think. Um, there's more music being released than ever before. There's more access to music than ever in the history of the world. Yeah. Is and, that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I generally think it's a good thing. Um, right. <laughs> you know, the, the, um, the, the lack of any kind of barrier to putting your creative content out into the world, I think, is a good thing. The more mm. art in the world, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it certainly makes it harder for you know anyone to gain any traction <clears throat> simply because there's just so much music out there and um you know before whereas labels were effectively the the sort of tastemakers and gatekeepers for essentially the majority of what the world was listening to yeah um now there's so much independent music out there that you don't you know, you know and, and ways to discover it that you don't need a label uh or a you know uh, radio promoter um, to tell you tell you what music um, you ought to be into, um, hmm. and the you know the way that the economy has shifted though has you know has affected um, the sort of studio class if you will uh, quite a bit. The producer, right. engineer, mixer community has taken, and the studio industry itself has taken quite a hit um, over over the past decade or so. Yeah, um, exactly. And it's been it's been sort of hard to see. I mean, there's, you know, folks that just are no longer in the business. They've decided this is not for me. Uh, there's been studios, all, uh, you know, around Los Angeles that have had to close their doors because the demand isn't there. The project studio, the small digital audio workstation, laptop computers, pro tools in the bedroom, you know, thing has really um, taken a, a huge bite out of the business for the studio community um, yeah. all across yeah. the country, really. And of course, there are the large, larger studios that remain uh, healthy. Um, in LA, it's you know Capital and East West and uh, United and the Village and and a few others. And you know Nashville obviously has its yeah. um, sort of core um, studios. New York as well. But even in New York, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of closures. So it's you know it's been it's been an interesting period to sort yeah. of live through. Um, yeah, it's the same back thing, in the day, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. And you know, when I travel to London, there's just, yeah studios that I might used to drop in on before. Just they're gone. They're just closed, and now they're you know now they're uh, they're flats. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, um, something I love to ask you about is because I, I think you mentioned this in the beginning is you know you try to find work for your clients if they're maybe not working or they're not busy. Um, so how how do you go about finding work for your clients? Um, is that through your list of past clients or past relationships you have built what's your process yes absolutely we 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 definitely um uh, you know value and continue to cultivate our past um working relationships with a manager or an A&R executive we've worked with in the past we try to keep in close touch with them to find out what else they're working on or have they signed something new or is that same artist getting ready to make another record and can we can we talk about uh, working with them again. Um, a number right. of our clients have made several records with the same acts over years. Ethan produced three records for Ray LaMontagne, uh, you know, Billy Bush, a couple of records for the Boxer Rebellion and uh, Fink, um, and, you know, other clients, Noah Georgeson making records with Devendra Banhart for many years, record after record. So, you know, we like to do repeat business and we try and cultivate that at all times. And, how long would you say the the time gap is usually between records? Because obviously this is not return business. That might that might happen a few years apart, right? Generally, yeah. yeah generally, you, you know, you're going to make a record. The record's going to, you know, sort of go into the setup process, and six nine months later it comes out, and then of course you've got to sort of live through the cycle, and the artist is likely to you know go touring and and um, you know try to hit the festival seasons and and stuff, and then you know, sort of come out the other end of that and maybe start writing. So, you know, it's generally 18 months to two years later, you're ready to have that conversation again. Right. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, even if you're trying to work with, um, 
in order to sort of on a repeat kind of basis, you got to stay busy in between <laughs> with lots yeah. of other stuff because two years goes by. Um, you know, you can't be waiting around for that same artist no. to come back <laughs> to you. Um, but how do you keep that relationship warm between those two years? Is that just every now and then you reach out, say, hey, how's it going? Or Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. exactly. And um, it's likely that that manager or A&R executive has, you know, a number of other things going on. So we try to be talking right. about those things, too. Um, you know, there's certain clients um, that have made records for the same manager, um, different artists, for for example, uh, Fink and the Boxer Rebellion are both managed by the same uh, manager, um, Sumit Bothra at ATC in London. And mm. so, you know, the the beauty of developing a relationship is that the manager or the A&R executive can see, you know, sort of what your client sort of brings to bear on any particular project. And I think, geez, maybe this person would be great for this other thing I'm doing. Um right whether it's producing or mixing or, or engineering and mixing. So, yeah, I mean, we just, it's a constant um, uh, level of output, frankly, mm. where you're reaching out to folks, checking in, what are you working on, any new signings, um, need any help with anything, need anything, you know, a couple singles mixed, do you need, you know, um, to do demos or, you know, what, whatever it might be. I mean, we're constantly sort of working the phones and email and I'm cold calling people, cold emailing people, right. dropping in on people when I'm in various uh, places, Nashville, New York, London, and trying to set up meetings, learning more about what people are working on, what's coming up. And, you know, generally the source of our uh, work is coming from uh, conversations that are being had with label executives, A&R, and with artist management. Um, right really it right because those are the those are the sort of uh, folks that are making decisions about their bands and the next record and planning and budgeting and uh you know getting all the songs together and that sort of thing and, tr and then you know ultimately deciding who do we want to talk to yeah uh, to make the record and so you know with management in particular um when you're trying to cultivate those relationships it really it really is beneficial in a in a sort of an early days you know, kind of sense, right? Because a manager is probably looking a little further ahead out on the schedule than, than their label might be. Yeah. And the manager might be interested in, you know, introducing their client to producers or mixers, you know, a little early or earlier than a, a record company might. So right. it allows us to sort of get in there a little, a little earlier, a little ahead of, ahead of folks, uh, if you will. And, you know, artists are coming through, Uh, LA or Nashville or wherever else we have clients and, you know, maybe doing a writing sessions or they're trying to, you know, maybe meet some people. So we set up coffees, we set up co-writes, we set up impromptu kind of, let's see how this works in the studio kinds of sessions. Right. Um, <clears throat> so that we're doing things really early, trying to make impressions really early instead of waiting for people to sort of create their list and then ultimately call us, you know, because yeah. we we're on a list somewhere. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's super good tips, man, actually. Um, good to know. Um, so for producers or engineers um, who might be in a position to get a manager or look for a manager, um, how can they get a manager, basically? Or is it usually a manager who reaches out to, for example, an engineer or producer? Um, it, it goes both ways. Um, mm. we, we have approached folks in the past um, simply because we like their work. And right. obviously if they are managed already, that's not a conversation we're going to start right. because <laughs> that's a, um, sort of a, a form of poaching and we don't do that here. Right. Um, but if a, uh, a person's out there and they're, they appear to be unmanaged, they're, you know, their own phone number or email is listed on their website or whatever. Um, we will reach out and, um, and try and open up a dialogue and just say, hey, we're huge fans of your work. I mean, that's really what the, the at the end of the day, what it's all about here. Um, mm. we're, we're in business. We run a business. But we're also massive music fans and, you know, fans of all kinds of music, everything wow. from, you know, jazz music to, uh, you know, classic uh, sort of Americana singer-songwriter style music to, you know, sort of hardcore hip-hop. So it's... Mm. It's, you know, if we're interested, it's because 
the, it's the music. It's what the client does um, on any particular project. There was a a, uh, a record that came out a few years ago that um, one of the guys on the team here uh, was really digging and um, dug into who mixed it. And uh, the the band is Run the Jewels, and the um, mixer is a guy named Joey Rea. And you know Joey was busy working um, over the years and doing all kinds of stuff and working on records and uh, primarily mixing. And <clears throat> because of the Run the Jewels record that we just loved, mm. we reached out to him and started a conversation. And after a few months, um, he became our client. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, and he's been doing really cool work ever since. And we're trying to help, you know, sort of amplify his uh, his work and and stuff to the rest of the business. Um, then there are those clients who call us, you know, people who reach out, who say, hey, I like what you guys are doing over there. Are you interested in having a conversation? And, right. you know, we're always interested in having a conversation. Um, I always like learning about what people are up to and what's coming up and the work they've been doing and so on. Sometimes people are ready for a change. They've been with management and they want to try something different. Hmm. Um, for people who don't have management and they're that's sort of a, a, a step they're looking to take, I think one of the first things is, you know, is there something to manage? Um, frankly, yeah. it's, if, if, you know, I think sometimes people can confuse producer management, engineer, mixer management with uh, employment opportunities. Um, we're not an employment agency, if you will. We <laughs> yeah. don't have all the jobs to hand out over here. You know, yeah. like we're, you know, we're working just as hard as our clients are um, to find new projects to get involved in. So simply because you have a manager does not necessarily mean that the work is going to start coming your way. Um, right. You know, it can, um, and we like it when it does, but um, I think if you have enough going on and there's maybe a key record that you've been a part of, whether you produced it or mixed it, or, um, you know, a single that's out that's doing well and starting to gain some traction, it's like, you know, having something to talk about um, for a manager is going to be really important. Um, if you have worked on a lot of really cool records, but none of them have really broken through in any kind of a commercial kind of way, um, or without any key sort of, you know, factors like amazing press or right. tastemaker, you know, playlists and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just hard, right? Cause our job here is to try and, you know, sell our clients, yeah, um, exactly. pitch them. Right. And if there's, if it's, if it's difficult to pitch with what you've got, that makes our jobs that much harder. So yeah. Um, it can be a little bit chicken and egg, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, with, with that sort of thing. It's like, well, how do I get, you know, involved in projects that are going to sort of break through? Um, it, and then, you know, if you're uh, with a manager, you can maybe, you know, have some help with that. Um, so it's, it's a, a little bit of a tricky thing, right? Cause you've got to be trying to do this on your own until until the point in time comes where you could use some additional help. And a lot of times the stuff that we can help out with immediately is deal making and invoicing and getting you paid and improving the terms of your deals and right. trying to sort of in increase your rates um, and sort of negotiate like higher rates for you and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, sort of create a much more um, sort of public um, sort of outreach campaign on your behalf, making sure that you're, it's easy to find you if you want to hire this person and that sort of thing. So if you go to our website, you can see everybody's got a, you know, a profile page with lots of bio information and credits and music to listen to and the full discography and the whole thing. Mm. Um, and that just makes it, you know, easier to be found, frankly. Um, yeah, exactly. Sometimes our client page for a particular client will actually serve as that client's website if they don't have one on their own. Right. So... That's very interesting, man. Um, but actually, because I know you, you have other business to attend to. So could you, um, before we wrap up here, could you just let know the listeners, or let the listeners know where they can find more info about you and uh, your your company, GPS, and all those sort of things? Absolutely. Please visit us online at globalpositioningservices.net. We've got a pretty um, pretty interactive uh, website with our full client list of all of our clients. Um, and each of those clients uh, has their own page with lots of information to dig into, uh, biographical information, 
uh, lists of credits and uh, you know music to listen to. You can have sort of you know listen to full tracks um, from some of our clients. Each of them have their own uh, websites or Wikipedia pages or Instagram pages, and so you can you know link out to those things as well. Um, GPS is also on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So we're pretty we're pretty out there. We have a newsletter. Folks want to sign up and you know get uh, information about new clients or new announcements that we're making. We're we're, um, we're online and posting new stuff pretty much on a daily basis. So if you sign up um, to follow GPS on Instagram, for example, you will see something new posted just about every day of the week. Yeah, yeah, I saw some new cool uh, clip today from your Instagram actually. Yeah, thanks. So we we have. Um, you know, we've definitely, um, you know, tried to keep uh, keep that pretty active um, so that people know what our clients are up to. And frankly, um, it's increasingly difficult to even know who's involved with a particular record um, mm. at yeah, any exactly. time because it's, it's harder and harder to find credits. And with all of the music that's out there in the world, it's harder to know even who was involved. So um, not only is it a way for us to promote what our clients are doing, it's also the the audience that we have out there. It's actually a way for them to be sort of tipped off to something that, you know, a particular client worked on a record he produced or mixed or co-wrote a single or whatever. Yeah. So um, we try to keep, you know, keep the, the promotion going uh, constantly and also, you know, <laughs> informing the community uh, and the industry at large of, of what our guys are up to. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm going to put a link in the description below so people can click it and check it. Uh, Great. But awesome to have you on, Jeremiah. It was a pleasure talking to you. You too, Nicholas. And um, yeah, let's keep in touch. Thank you very much, Jeremiah, for coming on to the podcast. It was awesome having you on. And I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Before you go, I'd love for you to leave a rating uh, and a comment if you can. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or YouTube, leave a comment below. Give a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to download your free guide, Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base, link below. And I'll see you guys next week.